to continue those conversations after church, around the coffee shop, around the, uh, the coffee cart, continue to, uh, to build community in this place. It is so good to be with you this morning, and I want to extend uh, that welcome that Brad shared before. Great to have you joining online. Great to have you here in the room. And each Sunday, we're having to kind of cast our field of vision wider and wider, and that's, uh, it's really great to, uh, to have you here today. But I want to ask you a question to begin with today. Did you lock the door on your way out this morning? Did you lock the door on your way out this morning? And I can tell all of you are kind of trying to retrace steps in your mind. Oh, did I? Did I push the button on the roller door? Did I lock the door on the way out? You know, you have that feeling. You kind of, oh, did I lock the door? Is everything okay? I never have that feeling because my wife always locks the door. And at risk of turning this into a counseling session, I, I need to share a little bit of the tensions in our marriage. And we have them from time to time. We're certainly not perfect. But one of the tensions we share is around security. See, Lauren grew up uh, in her teenage years in a house with a bit of property around it. And unfortunately, the house got broken into a number of times in her teenage years. And so she is very careful about security. She makes sure every time she leaves the house, the door is locked. And often she'll go back and check that it's locked. On the other hand, I grew up in a house... um, that only ever really got broken into when I forgot my keys. Uh, And I had to climb up on the second story and go through the window to get in. We were very fortunate to never have been broken in. So I'm a little bit blasé and probably a bit too blasé when it comes to security in our home. But uh, Laurie loves to have all the doors locked all of the time. Even in the midst of summer when we want to have a breeze in our home, she will open up the door... But behind there is a screen door, which is also locked and remains locked. Every time um, that we uh, we have been looking at maybe going into a a different house as our family grows, and one of the key considerations for a new home is, does it have security screens on the window? But one of the challenges that I have in this, and this is where the tension is, is that I'm a little bit blasé. And so when I come home, uh, I, I, I'm invariably coming out of the car, carrying something, uh, whether it's a shopping or a screaming child, and I come to the door and I've got to fish around in my pocket to open up the screen door. And then I've got to fish around for another key and open up the main front door. And then I try to pull that open, but the deadlock's locked. And so I've got to get another key and unlock that. And finally, my retina has been scanned, everything's been punched in, and I'm allowed to go in to my own house. You know, it's like that. And uh, I find this, she is so efficient. She's a lovely girl. She's so efficient at making sure that our house is locked. You know, I'm in the morning, I'll I'll kiss the lorry and the kids goodbye. See you later, guys. I'll walk out the door. I'll unlock the screen door. I'll unlock the main door. And then, of course, I'm kind of going back to the car and I'm carrying things and I'm almost at the car and I realize, oh, I've forgotten my lunch. So I'll head back to the door, I'll go to open the door, and she's already locked it. (sighs) The only problem is, the other day, I was walking, and this happens far too frequently, I walked out to the car, and I realized, oh, I've left my car keys at home. And so I walked back to the door, and then I had this realization, actually, no, I've left my car keys unlocked in my car the entire night. So I think, you know, it's probably a good thing that she is a little bit more concerned about the security than I am. You can see why there's a bit of tension. We have to work that through. But as much as I make fun of Laurie's security consciousness, and I won't dwell too long on the story the other day that she left her keys in the lock outside the entire night, as much as I make a little bit of fun of her consciousness around all of that, I do really appreciate it. Because there are times... In our, t- in our days, in our weeks, in our, our months, that we want to make sure that valuable things are locked up and secure. We don't want our things taken. We don't want people invading into our homes uninvited. And we want to protect the valuable things that are inside. But sometimes I think that we can be locked up a little bit too much. And I'm moving here from the physical to the metaphorical. Now, we can be locked too much in our fear, And we need God's power to break us free. And this morning, we're going to look at a group of people who are very careful to keep their doors locked because of their fear. 
And we're going to see how God used that same group of people to break out revival in their city. This month, we're preaching through a series called Revival and looking at Jesus' mission on earth. And in his first ever sermon, Jesus read a prophecy from the book of Isaiah and declared that he had come to fulfill that prophecy through his life and ministry. Jesus said these words in Luke chapter 4. He says, The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. And Jace, uh, our senior pastor, launched off our series last week uh, with a uh, a fantastic message around bringing good news to the poor. And I want to encourage you, if you missed last week, make sure you head to our website and watch that message. But Jesus continues in Luke chapter 4. He said, He has sent me, God has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight to the blind. This was Jesus' mission. He came to earth to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and bringing sight to the blind. Freedom from prisoners and sight to the blind. Say it with me. Freedom for prisoners, sight to the blind. And indeed, Jesus spent his entire ministry doing just that. He brought freedom to all of those who faced all sorts of imprisonment. He set people free from demonic possession. He healed a woman who had been considered unclean and sent outside the village all of her life. And he helped the physically blind see. Even rubbing his own saliva on someone's eyes, uh, a blind man's eyes, to heal him and restore his sight. And he opened the eyes of many who were spiritually blind, showing them the truth about God's love and grace and forgiveness. Jesus' ministry was all about bringing freedom for prisoners and sight to the blind. But after a few years of his ministry, the Jewish leaders and authorities of the day, they began to feel threatened by Jesus' influence and his message. And so they plotted to kill him. And ultimately, they were successful. They convinced one of Jesus' followers to betray his friend. Then they arrested Jesus on trumped up charges and and then executed him like a common criminal. And the Jewish leaders thought that they were doing the right thing for themselves. But ultimately, God had a different plan. See, Jesus had always known that he would give his innocent life so that the sins of humanity could be forgiven. While the the Jewish leaders thought that killing Jesus would silence his message, Jesus always intended to give his life as a sacrifice for others. And that's why we remember communion like we did this morning. And then on the third day, his miraculous resurrection would change the course of human history. Today, the resurrection is the central pillar of the Christian faith. But to his disciples in that first few days and weeks after Jesus' death, it was a challenging and difficult and even fearful time. And this fear is what led the disciples to barricade themselves behind a locked door. The Gospel of John gives us this picture of some very fearful disciples. See, Mary Magdalene was the first one to actually see the risen Jesus. And she rushed back to the place where the disciples were gathered. But they were all locked inside. The door was locked. And uh, I'm going to stick behind the door for a second. And John uh, says to us, he says, On the evening of the first day of the week, the disciples were together. The doors were locked for fear of the Jewish leaders. And Jesus' closest followers had gathered together, fearful and uncertain, and had holed themselves up behind this door. See, the disciples were afraid. They just lived through a harrowing experience. They'd seen their friend, their teacher, their Lord. They'd seen him arrested and beaten, seen him falsely tried, and seen him hung to death on a cross. And they were living in fear of the Jewish authorities, afraid that the same fate might await them. So they had denied that they knew him. They'd abandoned him. They barricaded themselves in and bolted the door shut. The disciples were imprisoned by their fear. And they were blind to what was happening around them. That same time in a different gospel, we have this story of these two disciples on the road to Emmaus. And they were walking uh, seven miles from Jerusalem to Emmaus, and they were joined on the way by a companion. 
And that companion asked them what was going on, and, and they started telling them about this event where this God, this God, this Savior had come and given his life. And it wasn't until they sat down with that companion in Emmaus and started to eat that they realized that this companion that they'd been walking with for the last seven miles was actually the risen Jesus. The Spirit gave them fresh eyes, fresh perspective to help them realize that this was Jesus, that he had risen. So they ran back. They ran the seven miles back to Jerusalem and joined the disciples in the locked room to tell them of the good news. But these guys, they were fearful. Even though there were some good things happening, they were fearful. And over the next 40 days, Jesus continued to appear to his disciples. He ate with them, he encouraged them, he commissioned them. But he also told them to wait, to wait for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. 40 days after his resurrection, Jesus ascended back to heaven. But the disciples continued to wait, probably still a little bit fearful, a little bit nervous about what was happening, maybe even still with the doors locked because of the, the, the Jewish authorities and what they had done to Jesus. But all that changed on the day of Pentecost. The, the Jewish people had three significant festivals through the year when they would make the pilgrimage to Jerusalem. They would come to the temple to worship, to sacrifice, and to celebrate God's goodness to them. And one of those festivals was the Passover festival, where Jews from far and wide would come into town and celebrate the Passover. But another one of these festivals was called the Festival of Weeks, or the Festival of the Harvest. And it was at the time of year when the, uh, the, the agricultural festival, the, the Jews would bring their first fruits of the wheat harvest into the temple. From all across uh, the, the known world, they would come with their sheaves of wheat that they've just gleaned from the fields. Then they'd bring them into the temple and they would bake bread as an offering before the Lord. They would travel from across the known world into Jerusalem. And this event was called the Feast of Weeks. But it also came to be known as Pentecost. Because it happened seven weeks and a day after the Passover. It was 50 days between the Passover and Pentecost. And Pentecost simply means 50. So on this day of Pentecost, the Jewish believers who had traveled from as far and as wide as Asia and Rome and Egypt and Arabia were in the city of Jerusalem. But no doubt the, uh, the Jesus' disciples were still gathered but gathered in a house, the, the, the scripture tells us that they were gathered together. And they're probably still hiding behind these locked doors when Jesus' promised spirit came upon them. Acts 2 says this, When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues or languages as the Spirit enabled them. See, they'd been huddled in fear behind this locked door. But as the Spirit came, the disciples were freed from their imprisonment. They saw God moving powerfully right in their midst. And when the Spirit came, it brought freedom from fear and a new perspective of God's power. They came out of that locked house. They came out of those doors and into the city starting to proclaim the name and the message and the truth of Jesus in all of these foreign languages that people from all around the world spoke. And they heard these people, these unschooled, unlearned people who didn't naturally know these languages, proclaiming Jesus through the power that the Spirit had given them. The crowds were amazed, and the people couldn't understand what was happening until Peter fearlessly stood up and proclaimed the gospel. He started by sharing the prophecies of old and sharing the story of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. And he shared the good news of what Jesus Christ meant for all the people. And the Bible tells us in Acts that those who accepted his message were baptized and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. 
All of this is happening in a very short period of time. And what a festival it turned out to be for these disciples. They had been shut up and shut in. And they couldn't see or comprehend what God was doing. But as the Holy Spirit came, he released them from, from fear and he gave them a new perspective. He gave them boldness and courage and strength to proclaim the good news of Jesus. Jesus had come to bring freedom for the prisoners and sight to the blind. And here is the Holy Spirit continuing that work. The disciples were freed from fear. Their eyes were opened to God moving in powerful ways. And the Holy Spirit threw off the shackles of imprisonment and called them into something brand new. And lives were changed like that in a moment's notice. And revival broke out across the city of Jerusalem. Now we keep reading this incredible account in Acts 2 and we discover what the early Christian community looked like. They weren't even called Christians at this point. That would come later. And this is what they were doing in the days after Pentecost. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. And all the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. And every day they continued to meet in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. This is revival, people. This is revival amongst God's people, revival in the city. Jesus' followers had gone from fearfully huddling behind closed doors to boldly meeting and praying in the temple courts. They'd been transformed from hiding in fear to sharing food and fellowship and favor with all of those around them. They were no longer blinded by their own circumstances, but instead they began to look to the needs of others. And they were seeing God's power move incredibly in the lives of the people in their city as more and more people put their trust in Jesus each and every day. Now the Holy Spirit lit the flame and the church was born and God was at work. According to Luke, who wrote this book of Acts, there were three main hallmarks of this early church. Firstly, these new Jesus followers, as I said, they weren't even called Christians yet, but these new Jesus followers were devoted to Jesus and to one another. Luke tells us they were devoted themselves to the, whole, the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. And then further, every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. So these people were deeply committed to the gospel. They were dedicated to sharing life with one another and they were passionate about prayer. In this small glimpse that we get to see what happened in this early community, these people were fully devoted to following Jesus. Their commitment to Jesus and to one another wasn't just an add-on to their life. It was the very foundation of all that they did. They were at every prayer gathering. They went taking notes during all the messages they heard. They hosted life group and contacted everyone in the group during the week to pray for them. They never made excuses why they weren't at church and the, or they couldn't serve on a team because they made it a priority. And as they devoted themselves to living out their faith, as they prayed together, revival continued to break out. See, when we pray together, God hears our prayers. He builds faith up within us. And the Holy Spirit gives us a fresh perspective. Oh, I believe if we want to see revival come in our time, in our day, we need to unlock the prayer closets. We need to unlock the doors of our prayer rooms and get on our knees and cry out to Jesus. Revival throughout the ages is invariably birthed in prayer. Throughout history, whenever revival breaks out, whenever the Holy Spirit moves powerfully, inevitably it's because there's been a wave or a prayer movement, faith-filled prayer, people gathering to pray. I want to invite you this week to pray for revival. Across the state this week, Queensland Baptist churches are gathering to pray. Uh, they're praying 24-7, uh, people praying all throughout the week. And churches are coming together to pray for one another, to pray for our state and to pray for our nation. 
Tomorrow night here at McKenzie, we're hosting a prayer gathering with some of the local QB churches in our region. And we're going to gather together to pray for revival. Uh, We often have a Tuesday prayer meeting here right in this stage, and that's an incredibly powerful time, but we're shifting it this week. We're moving it to Monday, tomorrow night, to pray for revival together, to join with other faith-filled believers and devote ourselves to prayer. we would love to have you join us 7 o'clock tomorrow. Secondly, as revival broke out in Jerusalem, these Jesus followers were generous with their wealth and their welcome. Luke tells us in Acts 2, he says, All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions and gave to anyone who had need. And they broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts. This incredible selfless generosity was the hallmark of the early church. And they met the needs of people in their community. A few years ago, I had a deep conversation with my children about economic theory. They were coming to the terms with the concept of money. And they had this plan. They hadn't read Milton Keynes or, uh, I'm sorry, John Maynard Keynes or Milton Freeman yet because they were so little young kids. But they had this utopian economy idea. And in their economy that they described to me, food would be free, houses would be free, and good luck. And most importantly, toys would be free. And uh, they were telling me about this world that they would love to live in. And, uh, and, and they said that everyone would have what they needed because we'd all own everything together. I chuckled to myself and wondered how they were getting socialism in the primary school so early. But I did kind of wonder and realize that this community, this idea that we would be looking after others' needs, that we would be effectively what is in their hearts. They just wanted to give toys to people for free. That, they, that that's what the early church was doing. They were being incredibly generous to meet the needs of others. They were generous with their wealth and used the, the blessings that God had given them to bless others. And they were generous with their welcome. They frequently had people in their homes welcoming them through their front doors and sharing hospitality with them. This picture that we get of the early church community is an amazing image of the impact that a church can have on its community through their generosity. This month, we're talking a lot about Gateway Beyond and the opportunity that we have as a church to generously sow into the work that God is doing here locally, around our city and nation, and indeed across the world. The heart of Gateway Beyond is to share the life-changing message of Jesus with people locally and globally. And we have a strong history in this church of being a light to the nations, sending Gateway Beyond workers all around the world to share the love and the hope of Jesus. And we stand committed to doing that. Uh, That won't change. Tonight even, we're we're talking about sending new Gateway Beyond workers out into the field. We're supporting some significant projects in some dark parts of the world. And I'd love to invite you to come back tonight to hear some more of the stories of what God is doing. As you heard last week, we're also uh, supporting our local care and community uh, ministries, the ministries of our caring community through Gateway Beyond. Our counseling centers and our, our, our care centers, our op shops and our neighbors ministry. These are all incredible ways that our church can impact this city for Jesus. And this year, we are calling our church to invest into new opportunities, to develop new campuses and open new doors in our campuses through Gateway Beyond as well. Like the Acts 2 church, we want to be generous with our wealth and our welcome to meet the needs of our community and welcome them into our family. And over the next few years, we want to um, be developing our campuses and developing new campuses so that more people can walk through those new doors. Here at McKenzie, we've got a dream to create a permanent home for our care ministries and our counseling center. These ministries just out the side, if you you go up to the car park, you can see them. Or if you wander out those doors, you can see them. They're still in, in temporary demountable buildings. They're bursting at the seams. And these ministries are doing incredible work, blessing those in our community and meeting the needs of the people there. But we want to bring these ministries closer to the heart of our property. So the people we minister to in our community during the week will feel more comfortable joining our church family on the weekends. Although it's only 50, 60 meters, there's a big disconnect. 
And people are comfortable coming to the op shop, but they might not be as comfortable coming in to our services. And we want to minister to people in our community during the week and invite them to be part of our family on the weekends. We always want everyone who walks through our doors to be welcome. We want to enlarge and increase our our hospitality spaces at the front of this building so that there's more room for more people to connect. Connect during Sundays, connect during the week. We want to help people kind of make those connections and take advantage of this beautiful space that God has blessed us with. Just like the early church, we want to be generous with our wealth and generous with our welcome to meet the needs of our community and grow together in Christ. And I want to encourage you to be praying over the next couple of weeks how you can generously give to Gateway Beyond to see lives changed in our community, nation, and world. The third hallmark of this church in Acts 2 was that as they gave God the glory, he grew the church. Luke says that they were praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. All glory went to God. And as the Holy Spirit transformed these Jesus followers' lives, other people started to notice. They enjoyed the favor of the city for a while. They even found favor among some of the religious leaders. And the gospel message which they proclaimed spread and impacted thousands upon thousands of people. God grew his church as the Holy Spirit gripped people's lives And God got the glory. Now, this is revival, people. This is the Holy Spirit moving, uh, helping people trust in Jesus and seeing the church growing. See, when God's people are filled with the power of the Spirit, the church helps people to see the promise of salvation. When God's people are filled with the power of the Spirit, the church helps people to find the promise of salvation. I believe that we're seeing that here at Gateway. If you were here last week, we uh, had the incredible joy of sharing and celebrating with Shona and Isabel as they stood in the baptistry and declared their faith in Jesus. The Holy Spirit is moving in their lives and in the lives of their family. Last year, Shona felt a prompting as she was uh, watching TV, of all things. She was watching TV and felt a prompting from the Holy Spirit to take a step in her faith and commit to being part of a church community. And at the same time, the Holy Spirit was speaking in a similar way to her boyfriend. And so they both stepped through those doors and came to church here at Gateway McKenzie. The Holy Spirit was moving in their lives, bringing freedom from fear and a new perspective of God's power. And the Spirit fanned Shona and her boyfriend's faith into flame. And Shona came along to Alpha. The Holy Spirit was working in her life and and she was being impacted by what she heard. And so she brought her mum and dad to the next Alpha. And the Holy Spirit was working in their lives as well and rekindled a faith that had been lying dormant for a number of years. As they put their trust in a God who loves them, he changed their lives. And like those in the Acts 2 community, they're now devoted to worshiping God on a Sunday, committed to their life group and showing generous hospitality to those around them. In fact, Andrew is up the back here today, mate, and I just want to say a huge thank you. Andrew was here pretty much the whole day yesterday. He was here uh, at Alpha as well. He's bringing more people through Alpha and here for our Holy Spirit Day. And and then uh, last night at our men's event, he was here till everyone else had left, looking after the fires that we had and making sure that they were all out and didn't cause any more problems. Mate, I've just seen God working powerfully in your life, Andrew, and it is such a privilege to be a witness to what God is doing, both in your life and in the life of Anne as well. Just want to encourage you and uh, and celebrate what God is doing. Can we just uh, give Andrew some encouragement this morning? I'm seeing your generosity. I'm seeing your generosity with your time. Be a blessing to others. And then Shona as well. Shona, uh, Andrew's, uh, Andrew is Shona's dad. And Shona had invited her friend Isabel along to church. And as we heard last week, Isabel was an avowed atheist, but the Holy Spirit was doing an amazing work in her. And within three weeks, he completely flipped her life upside down. And now Isabel is, uh, is following Jesus. The Holy Spirit has worked in her life, brought her freedom from fear and a new perspective on God's power. And she was here also yesterday in the Holy Spirit Day at Alpha and just blown away at what God is doing in her life. And God is still at work. 
Last Sunday, when the girls got baptized, they, uh, their friends and family were here as well, and God is continuing to work in their lives. This is what happens when the Holy Spirit moves, when people pray and we start to see revival break out. And I know that there are many other stories being written in the lives of people sitting in these pews this morning, in the lives of people sitting and watching online as well. And we're believing for more and more people to be standing in that baptistry, declaring their new life in Christ. You want to see more of that? You want to see revival break out in this church, in this city, in our time? I hope you do. I hope you do. This is what revival looks like. Fully devoted followers of Jesus, filled with the power of the Spirit, praying passionately, living generously, and proclaiming the good news of Jesus Christ. When God's people are filled with the power of the Spirit, the church helps people see the promise of salvation. And that same Spirit that church, that same Spirit that sparked the church into being, that same Spirit that rose Jesus from the dead, that same Spirit lives in you. If you're a follower of Jesus, the Spirit of the living God is living in you. And he wants you to bring, he wants to bring you freedom. He wants to give you a new perspective. He wants to pl- want you to play your part in his revival work today. So I want to ask you this morning, what are the things that are locked up in your life? Where do you need the Holy Spirit to bring you freedom? What are the things that are just hidden behind a locked door? that you need God to break you out of? Where does the Holy Spirit need to bring freedom for you? What sort of new perspective do you need the Spirit to bring? Do you need the Holy Spirit to just spark that devotion to Jesus in you once again? To stoke that flame of your faith? To burn brightly for Him? Maybe your faith has been flickering or or floundering. Perhaps you've been distracted by other things or just fallen out of a habit. You just haven't put a priority on reading God's Word or praying to Him. I want to challenge you this morning. It's time to make a change. It's time to pull open the door and pull the Bible out of the cupboard and start a new reading plan. It's time to open the door to the prayer room And add prayer into your morning routine. It's time for a fresh perspective and to make Jesus your priority again. Or do you need to follow the church's example in Acts 2 and be more generous in your hospitality? Maybe you need to unlock the front door of your home and invite people in to share life with them. Draw some people together and start or restart a life group. Open your home as a place for people to to, to meet and to share and to pray. I think we've had enough social isolation to last a lifetime. It's time for us to open those doors again and live generously with our hospitality. Or perhaps this morning you're here and you're needing the Holy Spirit to give you courage to proclaim the good news. You need to be freed from the fear that is holding you back from stepping out and sharing about Jesus. Do you want the Holy Spirit's courage to talk with your colleagues, your friends, about what you actually got up to on a Sunday, to offer to pray for them, and to practically show them the love of Christ? You desperately want to see Jesus move in a fresh way in people's lives. I want to ask you, what is your prayer for what you need the Spirit to do in your life today? On that day of Pentecost 2,000 years ago, the Holy Spirit moved powerfully in the lives of Christ followers. And when the Holy Spirit moves, He brings freedom from fear and a new perspective of God's power. The disciples were brought out of their hiding. They came out from behind locked doors and they saw God moving powerfully in the lives of others. They devoted their lives to Jesus in prayer. They lived with an incredible generosity. And they fearlessly proclaimed the gospel. And many, many people came to faith in Jesus Christ. Revival broke out in Jerusalem that day. And we are still seeing the reverberation of that around the world two millennia on. Today, 
as Brad mentioned earlier, is Pentecost Sunday 2022. It's been 50 days since Easter Sunday. And so there's no better time to pray as a church. God has really placed on my heart today that we would follow in the footsteps of that community in Acts 2 and pray for one another today. Often on a Sunday, we have a prayer team down the front and, uh, and we invite people to come down the front to receive prayer. But this morning, we're going to shake it up a little bit. We're going to take a leap of faith today. And I want to challenge each and every person here. I want to invite you to pray for someone else this morning. And all those watching online, we've got, uh, well, we want you to be included in this as well. And we're about to turn this church into a bit of a prayer meeting. And it's going to get a little bit loud. It's going to get a little bit messy. And it might cause you just have to step out of your comfort zone just a little bit. But we did this at the 8 a.m. service and it was powerful. So why don't we all stand right now? I'm going to invite you to stand. And in a moment, I'm going to invite you just to turn and pray with someone around you. Just pray a simple prayer that the Holy Spirit would move powerfully in their life. You might know them already and you might so know some of their story. You might not know them at all. But I want to encourage you to just push through. Take that step of courage. And just to introduce yourself if you don't know their name. Pray the Holy Spirit would move powerfully in their life. We're going to turn to one another and if you're comfortable, you can share something that you would like prayer for. Then we're going to start praying. If you're new to this or you just don't know what to pray, there's going to be a simple prayer up on the screen that you can use to pray for someone around you. A prayer that the Holy Spirit will bring freedom from fear and a new perspective of God's power. So we're going to create some space to pray. And as the band quietly uh, plays, I'd love to invite you to turn to someone, introduce yourself if you don't know them or you've forgotten their name from a little earlier in the service, and just begin to pray. Take that leap of faith and pray that the Holy Spirit would move powerfully in our lives this morning. Come on, let's turn to one another and start praying for one another here this morning. And Gateway Online, we don't want you to miss out at all. You know, you are a community. You are together, being here together today connected digitally all around the world. And I want to invite you to start praying as well. You've probably seen names in the chat. Maybe you're sitting there on your keyboard. I want to encourage you, jump in the chat. Add your name in this morning and just start praying for people who you are doing this experience with today. Even type your prayer in the conversation. God hears our prayers. And we'd be love to, love to encourage you to be praying that the Holy Spirit would bring freedom from fear and a new perspective of God's power today. Let's pray. to life. 
life what is yours we thank you for the work that you're doing in people's lives right now for the freedom that you're bringing for the fresh perspective that you're bringing God, I thank you for people gathered across this room, gathered online, just reaching out to pray for one another, encouraging one another in the faith, stirring one another up, Lord God. And Holy Spirit, we pray that you would be at work in our lives today. Lord, would you bring revival to our hearts, Lord God. Would you bring revival in our church, we pray, Jesus. Would you bring revival in our city, Lord God. Would you stir up a fresh devotion within us, Would you help us to live lives of generosity? Would you help us to fearlessly proclaim the gospel, we pray, Jesus? Oh Lord, we wanna see miracles happen. We wanna see what happens when earth collides with heaven, when your spirit breaks out and just works in our city. Jesus, we pray that you would continue your work amongst us, Lord God. I wanna encourage you to keep continuing to pray. But we're gonna sing this song that has been birthed out of our church. A number of our worship leaders have gotten together and, uh, and just sense that this is a song, a prayer in season for us as we seek God and pray for revival. And we're gonna sing it together as a prayer today, praying that the Holy Spirit would work within us. So whenever you're ready, I wanna encourage you to join in and, and uh, be part of this prayer, be part of this song as we seek revival.
want to see you move. Jesus, we thank you for what you have done in our hearts, in our minds, in our lives this morning. And I pray that as we walk out these doors, that your spirit would continue to lead us, embolden us, help us to live lives devoted to you, live lives filled with abundant generosity and to fearlessly proclaim the gospel. God, may your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. We pray that revival would come. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Hey, uh, thank you so much for being here today, for joining us online. Just in that experience, it was such a privilege seeing people gather around and pray. And if you stepped uh, over the fear threshold, over the chicken line, as they say, and uh, the Holy Spirit helped you overcome that fear today, I want to encourage you to be emboldened as you head out that door. There is no telling what God can do when we step out in faith and be bold for Him. Hey, look forward. If you're coming back tonight, we'd love to see you here tonight at our Beyond Celebration Night. Other than that, we'll catch you next Sunday. Be blessed. Have a good one. We hope you've been blessed by this message. If we can pray for you or you would like to take a further step in your relationship with Jesus, we would love to connect with you. Please head to gatewaybaptist.com.au and click on Get Connected to let us know.